Here we go! And welcome everyone to another one of the SB Show podcast slash interview. And keeping with the theme as of late, we're talking video game music. And today, I uh, have a local guy here for you, Keith Brown, who is a classical music host, creator, and executive producer of Gameplay, uh, which you can find on the Interlock and Public Radio, and also syndicated nationally. Keith, thank you, brother, for being here, man. I appreciate it. Michael, thank you so much for having me. It's awesome, awesome to be here. Um, yeah. First off, like I mentioned, and we've talked, uh, and we talked to Dr. Matthew Thompson yesterday from University of Michigan about music, uh, especially video game music. Um, there's just a soft spot for video game music. And uh, you being a music buff, not just video game music buff, but um, I think it really, there's something that will always attach people at music. Um, and we, even when we started talking music, like we both love, we're both metal heads, uh, you know, Metallica. <laughs> and it was like, it seems like it doesn't matter if you're a real music buff, you go from classic to like the heaviest of heavy. Like there's always something that you find that is really good. So, yeah. um, I really do yeah, appreciate absolutely. you being here and talking about that brother. Um, but let's get into, uh, what is, you know, gameplay, um, what your love for video games and music has been through your you know, your childhood. So take me back to baby Keith, little Keith here, um, getting involved in video games and music. Um, but how did you go from, you know, playing some video games, getting into music to getting your own syndicated show from interlocking? Oh my God. Yeah. Well, I was born with this Mario shirt on. So, you know, <laughs> um, so no, so I, um, yeah, I've loved games my whole life, yeah. you know, since I was little, I, I was, a, we were a Nintendo household that yep. was sort of, you know, my mom was the one who got into games, you know, like right in the mid eighties, you know, when these consoles started appearing and stuff. So yeah, we had an NES in my house. That's kind of what I grew up with. Um, and just always, oh man, just legend of Zelda is, yeah. it was an all time, you know, the original legend of Zelda was a, a huge thing for me. I have great memories of playing, uh, things like Mario and, and duck hunt with my mm -hmm. dad, you know, and the little, I've still got the little, uh, the little, pistol shaped plastic peripheral yep. thing, you know um so good uh yeah so i have so many like just formative memories of of playing games um with my family and and with my you know with my siblings and stuff and uh yeah and that love has kind of just stayed with me you know when i went to college you know i i had a pc for the first time and then i got into pc gaming and and strategy and stuff like that and and um <clears throat> Yeah. And then, you know, so it's like games and music have always been a part of my life, too, because I played music as a kid. Um, I, I played trumpet in jazz band and marching band and that I, I went to a conservatory in, in Cincinnati to study trumpet. I ended up moving into opera. Um, so I started singing opera and then I got I got um, my master's in opera. And I was focused as uh, being a classical singer for almost 10 years of, of my career. I was focused on, wow. on opera singing and traveling and stuff. And um, yeah, and we basically we um, we landed up here in in northern Michigan because my uh, my wonderful wife, uh, she directs the opera workshop program and and is part of the voice faculty at Interlochen. Nice. Uh, for the arts. So we landed up here and. I just like got introduced to some people. Yeah, I had been interested in radio for a long time, but I I always assumed I didn't have the credentials or whatever. Right. You know, I didn't I didn't have broadcasting training, but you didn't go to the, Howard Specs or anything like that for you know. I didn't, green radio and right. I assumed I was disqualified automatically. Right. You know, I didn't know. I didn't know that all the stuff I'd been learning along the way was actually equipping me for what I do now. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah, I got introduced to people over here at at uh, at IPR and did an air check, and they were like, "Yeah, let's get this guy on the air," you know. And I, I, um, I was a fill-in host for a while. That's how I started out. Mm -hmm. Over time, I wore every hat. You know, I ended up playing at all the different hosting, all the different classical music shifts, and um, and yeah, and then you know, back in I want to say about 2019, our executive director Peter Payette. Uh, heard me going on in a meeting about I, I was really excited because we have some we have some, uh, some game music recordings in our library we in, in our broadcast library mm -hmm. and that even back then we had some and I was really excited about that and he heard me going on passionately about some article that I had read in the New York Times about you know video game music is so cool it's a 
a way to bring people into to music, classical music and live music. And he heard me going on about this. And he's like, you know, he must have just heard something in my voice. And he said, can you do a show? Could you make a show, a weekly show about video game music that could air? And I was just like, my heart was just like, <laughs> you know, I was so excited. And and it was cool that that was such a gift. It has been such a gift to me because it brought me back to kind of my my nerd roots mm -hmm. and it let me combine and, and kind of circle back into the world of video games in a way that I had kind of been out of touch for a little while. And then suddenly it became my job and my passion kind of mixed together. And uh, and it's just it's it's just such a gift. So um, all yeah, at a time when video games is just exploding, too. I you mean, know, yeah, you, you couldn't you couldn't have put that in a better spot, uh, especially during the pandemic. Obviously, the pandemic, a lot of people were home. Uh, video games, you know, were kind of the uh, first thing on hand for a lot of kids. Even a lot of families were sitting down and playing video games. A lot of people were getting the old consoles out and be like, hey, check this out. Um, but yeah, at 2019, you couldn't have picked a better time to get, uh, you know, a different medium over the airwaves, if you will. Sure. Um, sure. Because, like, is there any other radio shows that play video game music? Do you know of any? So, I know of a few, and I'll t I'll give a I'll give a plug for the moment. There are, there are there are a couple of great podcasts in the mm -hmm. U.S. that are focused on interviews around game music primarily. Right. So it's more interview content, and then and then there is some music that's woven in. Um, Emily Reese, uh, formerly of uh, Minnesota Public Radio, has an incredible program called Level with Emily. She interviews composers. It's it's terrific. Sure. Um, Kate Remington has a great program as well called Music Respawn um, that is a similar format. They're great shows, but they're they're not aired shows. They're kind of they're they're a little right. bit more focused. Um, uh, the there's there's just a couple shows in the world. I mean, the BBC right. uh, BBC has one. Oh, that's cool. Classic FM in the UK has one. Um, the ABC, as in Australian Broadcasting Company, yeah. it, it, uh, in Australia, has a wonderful program. But there's really just a couple, and I I was shocked to find that there's like, I assumed when we started this, I was like, well, we're probably going to be competing with like right. a dozen major shows crickets yeah. you know there were no shows there were no aired sh uh, broadcast shows in syndication yeah. that were focused on this and we were just like we thought that people people are discovering music through games and art through games this is going to be this is a big deal and we need to celebrate this world so yep. uh yeah so that that's been really exciting too to be like um in a way we get to kind of get out in front and uh and introduce this 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 whole medium to people that never paid any attention to it before. Right, you know? exactly, and uh, and we'll dive deeper into that as we go on because there's something about video game music, man, that just makes the game even more top notch than it actually is. Like I know people pour their sweat and blood and tears into making the game, but the composing the when you put the composing aspect over it, like it can make a game ten, fifteen, twenty, hundred times better. Um, and it just makes you dive deeper into it. Like, where would we be in this world right now if there wasn't that do 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 do? Like, I mean, that broke so many pop culture barriers. And it's a Absolutely. video game, you know. It's ninety seconds of loop, and we <laughs> it became a, a pop icon. Um, and still to this day, I mean, that guy, that little character is worth billions upon billions upon billions of dollars, really based off a theme song. Um, you know, granted there's some gameplay to it, but yeah, that song, uh, you play it, everyone knows it, uh, yeah, whether they're, they're two, three, you know? two, 90. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's crazy. Um, so let's talk about some of your achievements. Obviously you said, uh, you know, you did some games, you did, got heavy into music. Um, you went to Cincinnati, got your master's in opera, uh, opera. Yeah, so, that's right. Voice performance is voice what they call it. Yeah, but, uh -huh. Okay. Yep. So you got your right. master's in opera, which I had never heard of, which is uh, congratulations mm -hmm. on that. And you well, sang thanks. professionally uh, for mm -hmm. a bit. Um, yep. So take me through some of the achievements from, you know, some kind of these corner things that you might, some people might be surprised at, but all the way up to your show. You're a creator and executive producer. Are you the only one on the show? I'm the only one on my show. Right. No, we do have we do have a a small team that works on the show. I, okay. I would say that the vast majority of the work is is me. Yep. Uh, but that's also because um I'm the I'm the 
the guy with the weird combination yeah. of the skills. You know what I mean? It's no, like, I understand it's like, it because at the station, I'm the only one that knows anything about video games. So it's right. like, who's going to, who's going to sit down and do this with me? Cause there's not too many yeah. who knows. Plus when you're, when you're talking about certain aspects, like if you're the creator of the show, you have kind of a, a vision of what you want, unless you have somebody who is spot on chemistry wise with you or just knows your mind waves. Um, yep. they're not going to put the show together, maybe in the way precise way that you'd like to do it too. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think we, you need that, you know, yeah. I, I will say that, um, yeah, like the vast majority soup to nuts, you know, I, I, I am constantly listening to me. I mean, constantly listening right. to game music. I'm constantly listening to podcasts about games so that I can put stuff on my radar and throw it into a doc to look at in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I'm constantly making lists of theme ideas, you know, it's always evolving. So I do, you know, I do all the research, I, I source the music, sometimes I'm a, I'm a collector of video game music myself, just That's cool. I enjoy collect, I enjoy tracking down obscure CDs, you know, from and from Japan or whatever and collecting them. So sometimes I sometimes I find things that way, or I'll be like, I'm gonna pull this from my collection, and we're gonna like do a focus on this. Right. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have some contacts like in the in the industry too who know that you know they know about the show they found the show and so now when new soundtracks come out you know um the that gets sent sent to me you know so i'm i'm very privileged to be in that position as well so i'm just constantly researching and uh and and thinking about new ideas and mm -hmm. and i also do all the production work which i you know had to kind of learn to do on the fly um i've also been a voice actor so i had already yes. learned there was a lot of like home studio technology that I was familiar with. And I, I knew how to, you know, edit things and, and work in a session and things like that. I knew how to um, record my voiceover. Well, you know, I already had, I already had the mic and the setup and the, the, the pro studio. So I was really lucky to have all that, but I would say it's so crucial that I have um, our, my primary partner in, in putting together the show has been um, our music director, Amanda Sewell. Uh, Dr. Amanda Sewell, she's a brilliant musicologist who okay. she's the perfect person to be a co-producer with mm -hmm. because she's not a gamer herself. She's interested, like she's got an open mind and is interested, right. but she doesn't, she she didn't like grow up playing them. She kind of absorbed them through like other people in her life. And I, I think her husband, you know, plays games. So, um, so she's the perfect person for me to bounce ideas off of right. because if I go, if I go, all right, so this is my concept for this, this show or whatever, if it doesn't make sense to her, then it's really important that, that she tells me and that, and that we can kind of like focus up the show, right. you know, um, because I have to, I have to always keep in mind that as much as we, you know, you and I speak the lingo because we kind of grew up with it, right. but we're trying to, you know, the primary audience here are people that are like, ain't game music i didn't know that that's a thing right and then, and we're trying to like we're trying to like bring people in you know there's people that that don't know if i say rpg they don't even know what that is right so i'll have to kind of you know break down the barrier and be like inviting and uh so that's very important i think i think just having some a few people to collaborate with bounce ideas off of and to kind of sharpen things up you know is is so it's just crucial to have that filter yeah, it really is. Uh, and like you said, that was kind of my biggest barrier making the show was, all right, yeah, I know MMO, I know RPG, I know uh, shooter looter, but a lot of people don't understand that lingo. So you kind of have to, you know, uh, yeah. in the weather business, we call it, uh, you know, layman's terms, break it down, let these people know exactly what you're talking about. Because if you yeah. just continue on your way, they're like, I lost him in all three of these letters. I don't know what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they totally, I totally understand that 100%, brother. Um, but yeah. goals over the next five to 10 years, obviously you have this great show. The show is nationally syndicated. Where does it go from here? What is your goals in the next five to 10 years? Kind of that, you know, interview question. No one knows, but what's the plans? Have you thought five years down the road? Yeah. yeah you know, I, I think about it quite a lot, actually, um, in and in around just the actual nitty gritty of producing the show. Um, yeah, I think, I think, you know. What we envision uh, is the idea of taking, basically building like a hub for the appreciation of games yeah. and game music um, by by creating other kinds of content, reaching out, you know, like spokes of a wheel, kind of reaching out into other um, into other platforms and right. things like that, creating content for those platforms. Um, 
you know, uh, things like, you know, the world of podcasting uh, and, and, you know, YouTube programs, things like that. Um, so, yeah, we really kind of envision using the, you know, the broadcast show is kind of this like linchpin show mm -hmm. and then kind of building outward from there and and trying to reach more people through more platforms over time. So, yeah, that's that's really the the hope is to kind of turn it into a hub and uh -huh. a community, hopefully, too. You know, there's a community element, as we know, like games are all about, you know, people getting together and, and you know, loving their particular fandoms and things like that. And I want to be able to serve serve those people, too. You know, I can honestly tell you there is a spot on YouTube for what you do. Um, the visual aspect, obviously, like you could have uh, covers and whatnot, but I mean, I mean, the educational aspect of YouTube, there's a home for you there. Uh, so I don't know if you've thought about it or explored it yet, but I'm going to tell you right now uh, what you bring to the airwaves on the radio. There's definitely a home for it on the YouTube channels as well. Um, and oh, thank that's you. that's thank what I like about, you know, streaming in general. But at the same time, you don't have to stream it. You can record it and make it, a you know, 22 minute sure. show and put it on there. Um, but yeah, it would, there's definitely a home for that educational video game music. Um, cause the, uh, people would sit there, listen to it, have it on the background, watch it. Um, it would definitely be 100% uh, a go for me if I had the option for you. Um, but let's get into the questions, kind of dive into what is video game music, kind of a lot of opinions here, but also with your background in, uh, music, I think maybe we could discover some of these things, um, and kind of, you know, not not necessarily scratch the entire itch, but maybe get some understanding of what video game music is and what it does to us. Because there are a lot of concepts to this. Um, because a game, like I said before, isn't necessarily going to be as big without the perfect parts, and a lot of that is music. Um, but a lot of video games for you and I are memory makers. Like, I can tell you, I can give you dates of when games came out or what I was doing on this Thursday in 1997, but I can t cannot tell you what I had for breakfast, but it's a memory maker. Like there's certain things that you like about games um, that we hold so close, but what role does music have in this? Like what role does music have in these memory makers for these games for us? I think, you know, music for, for, it just provokes such a powerful emotional response in us. And I think that right. we tie it up in our, we tie it up in these formative experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's like, I don't know, the smell is something that, that your mom used to make or something right. like that. You know, the music, music just gets tied into your favorite, ex these experiences. And I, I just think there's also, there's an alchemy here, you know, mm -hmm. when it's like even more, in a way than film as great as film is right. because right. i think there's a sense of ownership that you like if you're playing the game even if even if it's a visual novel and you're just kind of choosing dialogue options and letting the story go over you that interactive element yeah. makes you feel like i'm making this happen yeah. and then when the music is woven into it the music like it heightens or it deepens the emotions or what whatever you know word you want to use but it uh, it just becomes inextricable from from the game experience itself, and I think that it's like it's we've experienced this, you know. But like the like the first time I heard um, Zelda music played by an orchestra, it brought back all this childhood. I just got chills because it was like I already loved. I'd grown up loving orchestras and stuff, but it like never even occurred to me that like an orchestra might play that music, and it took me back to childhood and discovering this huge world you know, that I could explore. And um, there's just something so exciting about that. And yeah, and I think, I think these musical memories, you know, get kind of woven together. And um, it just and takes it's, you it's back to power. something like, I, I, it's simple, maybe, maybe it's so simple that it just feels, you know, like, cool. I wish I could be back there. You know, obviously, if a lot of us, it transforms us back to a time of when we didn't have to worry or stress about a lot of stuff. Obviously, we were kids at the time, you know, um, but we were sitting down with friends or by ourselves doing something on our own, but there was something tied to like that boss fight. You beat that boss, but there's music tied to that. That always, you know, as soon as you hear that, you'd be like, oh yeah, I beat the boss here doing this, doing that. It's kind of like a trigger. The music yeah. is a trigger in so many ways. Like, um, you know, Mario, uh, like you mentioned, Zelda, um, I can tell you everything about Double Dribble because it's a simple sports, 8-bit sports soundtrack, but it, for some reason it just stuck with me. And I don't even play basketball, but I was like, 
shooting yep. that ball half court on the game, and it was great. Um, 007, when they had license tracks for uh, N64, like, that, I'm, I'm not a huge Bond fan, but it made me get into the Bond movies. And oh, that, that yeah. music is just so iconic. Halo, Bungie, mm -hmm. what they did with Halo was, I mean, it is the epitome of church music in my eyeballs. Like, there's nothing bigger in video game music than that opening sound from Halo. That just... The absolutely. chant is absolutely monstrous. And then when you look at what Ghostbusters just did, Ghostbusters just released a game, but it has all the sounds and all the music from the original movie. Tell me you're not tapping into nostalgia there because it instantly yeah. takes you into something, but it is so good too. Yeah, it, it taps into something really, I just think, really human and really deep in it us. It really does. When you, and that's why, you know, you hear, yeah, like you, like you said, that, you know, I get chills with that Halo theme too. I, I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. And so many, like so many, like millions and millions of people feel exactly the same way. And it's just, it takes a few seconds yeah. and it just, and your brain, it just, it just taps into something deep inside. And um, yeah, I think, I think that kind of stuff stays with people. And, and uh, so then when you give people a chance to like dig into it a little more or listen to it a little more intentionally than, than, you know, right. um, that is just like, yeah, it, it lights thought? up all the pleasure centers of your brain, you know? Who would have thought, you know, video games would be introducing people to really good music, uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, and it's yeah. really well done music, too, because it's not, oh, great. Um, you know, like some of the crazy music you have nowadays with Destiny and Halo. Like, it's, it is complete orchestras making you feel deeper, deeper, deeper in a game. You know, a game will take you to a spot, but when you put the right things to it, something will take you somewhere else in that game. Uh, and it's not no. just the game. Um, but as we said before, video game music has proven it can bust into pop culture scenes. Obviously, Mario, uh, they released the new trailer for the new Mario movie, and they put an orchestra behind the Mario music, which is like <laughs> just made it even more expansive. Halo, obviously, but you could go on and on and on about certain sounds in video game music. Do you think this plays into the game's popularity? Do you think Mario would have been as visible and as big? Granted, he was the first one that we all really know, but would he be that big without the music? No, I mean, I, I look, I mean, I, I can't, I guess, suppose I can't say anything absolute, but I, right. I feel, I feel no. Yeah. Cause I think this goes back to, you know, the infancy of digital games of, of video games in, you know, at the beginning when the technology was, was, you know, it was pushed to the limit just to have any kind of visual at all, you know, and, and we talk about text, you know, text-based games, uh, the addition of sound, like in the beginning of the arcade era, the attract function of just like a, a, that big, colorful arcade cabinet lighting up and yeah. going like, pew, you know, like big, powerful sounds grab your attention and pull you in. Guaranteed, people people would not have been, you know, uh, playing Space Invaders or whatever uh, in Japan, you know, in in when that was really popular you know yeah. there were in, you know there were entire arcades that that the only thing they had was a whole bunch of space invaders cabinets you know yeah. uh and that's in the you know the early days of of game sound where there was very little space oh, for yeah. music at all and it was extremely labor intensive but even so that sound function it transcends it goes beyond you know it really like it's it's way more than the sum of its parts all of a sudden and i i totally think that that it's like that that little bop at the you know the the original ground theme for Mario that we that we're thinking of, yep. uh, it just like it just taps into your fun center and right. it just it communicates something wordless but really powerful about what you're about to do. All right, I'm gonna have a good time. This is gonna be fun. We're running. We're jumping. We're we're you know we're yeah. we're smacking bricks you know and all this. Um, the music communicates something about the game, and I just don't think it would have penetrated the the just the cultural consciousness without without that connection to music. Oh no! And when you think about Mario, like Mario was pretty. When you come to music, it was pretty in depth. Uh, you know, under a hundred seconds, it speeds up, says you got to get going. You know, um, mm -hmm. and when you have uh, the flag sound, and you have the castle sound, you have the tunnel sound, and then you have. The different levels of sound so when you're like in with those dungeon layers the do 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 like and you realize something's happening but all of that as a kid was not tapping into me as oh like this is an expansion of the game you know but that who would have known 30 
five years later, here I am knowing that that song and all those sounds like the back of my hand. Um, and it's because it wormholed in, man. Like it is that good. Um, yeah. and, and to be honest with you, like I, I pro proposed a question to you about Mario, Sonic definitely wouldn't have been uh, as popular without that soundtrack. That soundtrack was something else. Yes, it was a 90 second or whatever loop of synths, but Sonic was not that different of a game. Yes, it was 16 bit, but 16 bit, you can do so much more with music. So they had mm -hmm. much more layered to the music, but it was yeah. catchy music. The controller was stupid, so it's not like the console itself was great, but Sonic <laughs> literally brought a, comp a competitor to Nintendo and actually pulled ahead of Nintendo for a brief period of time because of this character and this game and this sound, um, which yep. was very, very eye-opening, if you will. And I think a lot of companies have realized that over time. Um, yep. How does classical music play into video games? Kind of, a, kind of a vague question, but, you know, everything started from one thing, you know? If we're talking about, you know, classical music that, like, is pre-existing, that was, like, composed by, you know, Wagner or Bach, in that respect, like, existing pieces of classical music have been a part of games from the beginning. This is partly because, you know, the, the early days of games was kind of this Wild West. Um, right, right. You know, the idea of intellectual property was, uh, you know, we're way back before uh, Napster and all these, you know, <laughs> this was this kind of Wild West. And there was a lot of, um, you know, music could sometimes be kind of thrown in at the last minute or it would be like maybe a developer would just be like, hey, this hit song just came out. Can Just make a version of it in this. And they wouldn't even bother to get licensing, you know, right. uh, you know what I mean? Or it, yep. things that are wild today. And I also think that back then, with such limited budgets for things like music at the very early days, you know, they'd be looking for lots of things in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And classical music represents this whole body of pre-existing stuff that can then be, you know, in some cases sort of shoehorned in, but it can also be, um, you know, part of the identity of a game. Right. So you know, and I would say like, gosh, there have been countless games that have used just like movies that have used uh, Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries, that, right. you know, the apocalypse mm -hmm. now, but then it's in so many games from Grand, the uh, Grand Theft Autos, plural, all the way back. Um, some of the first Mac games that ever had sound uh, used Ride of the Valkyries. Um, there is a, a, a waltz that you recognize that's uh, called Over the Waves by Juventino Rosas. It's the one that goes, da, na, 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 na. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was used. I mean, in... Mario kind of had that in their water level, right? Yeah. I mean, it feels just like that, yeah. you know. Uh, and that was back in, you know, that was used in an arcade game called Carnival back in 1980. So, yeah, so it's always been there. Um, and I would also say, so many of the, just like in film and television scores, so many composers of film scores are heavily influenced by, you know, the music that they maybe studied or that they grew right. up with. Um, so there's a lot of influence of classical music among many other genres uh, and, and worlds in, in game music. So they're, oh, they're yeah. kind of like all mixed up together. I can't, I can't tell you how many games have Flight of the Bumblebee in it like, uh, or some take oh. of Flight of the Bumblebee um, just because that is such an iconic kind of roller coaster ride, if you will. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's influences everywhere. Um, like you said, you know, it might be what they're studying or what they grew up on or what they learned. And then they translate it into something more in the uh, film level or the video game level and just kind of put their little spin on it. But it seems like everything kind of spawns from that. Yeah. And if I may, I'm also just yeah. offer this too. And you've already picked up on this talking about listening to, you know, uh, like the Sonic episode is a great example of this. We're, we're exploring some fun music from, there's so much music. It could be, a, you know, a whole season right. could be on Sonic music. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, but we really think that, you know, I really think that we want to broaden the idea of classical music, the, the mm -hmm. definition of it, because there's nothing, it, it's a slippery term. And this might sound funny coming from a uh, classical music host on NPR guy, but we really, um, the world of game music is so rich. I mean, there's no other medium where you can have like, uh, you know, something that sounds like Tchaikovsky and also prog rock 
from the 70s and also synthesizers and also like funk right all say and celtic folk and whatever all in the same soundtrack sometimes you know uh it's such a rich and diverse world of sounds and i think that um something we love about me that i love so much about making this show is that we get to introduce people and and to these enriching sounds from other areas that i think a lot of classical like classical listeners that tune in expecting to hear something that sounds like Mozart or Brahms here and there, we, we absolutely give them that. But I, I love, and I'm very passionate about throwing in, you know, the sonic tunes with a jazz band, yeah. you know, for instance, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Here's a little bit of funk here and there in, in amidst the orchestra, you might find yourself connecting to some metal yep. or something. Like that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, we love to kind of broaden, broaden that world. Cause it's just, it's just such a rich world of, of sounds, you know? Yeah. I 100% I agree. Like, and to be honest with you, I think that's kind of what opened the door for me as a kid was, you know, I, I admittedly, uh, you know, as weird as it was as a kid, I always threw IPR on uh, when I went to bed. I think it was an 88.7. Uh, on my, I had it on my radio and classical music when I went to bed um, and it would be on in the morning. But it was such a soothing thing. But at the same time, who knows what was going through my head and what dreams I had while this music was playing, you know. But I also think it expands creativity. Um, just because there is, I've always, the thing I've always done with music, even video game music, but it's kind of already laid out for you is I put things from my visual, my brain, um, to that music. So it's kind of like making a movie or a show or a game on its own with the music. So you're thinking like, you know, when you're listening to the music, you can see things happening like a game or a movie or, oh yeah, this would be great for a chase scene, stuff like that. You know, I've always done that as a kid. Hence, I don't know if it's IPR, I have to thank for that, but um, it seems like it's always something that, you know, people always say, you know, stop living in a movie. But I always felt like if there was a theme song walking with me, you know, like there's th certain things with music that kind of puts me in that spot. Um, and it yeah. always has. Um, and I feel like that's kind of a uh, kind of thanks to classical music, if you will. Um, but if someone is looking to pursue video game music or has an interest in it, where should they start? Obviously, you took a different route, but do you know, like, like obviously, uh, it's not uh, just laid out in a degree, hey, video game music. There are video game classes, as we saw with Dr. Matthew Thompson yesterday, um, but how did they go pursuing this? You know, that's an awesome question. I, I think, now, this is, again, with the caveat that I, I'm coming as a, a professional who, who presents this music. I'm, I'm not a composer. Right. So, I, so there's a lot of nuance that I'm not going to be aware of, but I would say, and I, I think a lot of composers that I've spoken to for the show and stuff would back me up on this. I I think if you're interested in making music for games, I think you need to play games. Mm -hmm. And I think that you need to play a lot of games and play a lot of different kinds of games. Right. And, and then when you play them, play them in a different way where you're being more intentional about listening. Listen to the music that is happening at a given moment. Right. Listen to how listen to how the music changes as you interact with the game. Well, I, whatever it is that you're doing, pay really pay attention to to that. And then um, I would also say, you know, there's never been an easier time for people to self-educate about things like audio software and right. recording and things like that. There, there are tons of, I mean, there are free softwares out yeah. there. Um, that, that enable you to kind of play around with music production. Um, and I would say just, yeah, play games and play with audio software a little bit and and just just try to create stuff and play. I think that that sense of play is really important for probably any creator. Right. You know, you, you got to have a sense of play. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, you really need to immerse yourself in your medium if you're going to learn how game music works, how it ticks. You know, this this next couple of decades i mean it's just going to be insane to see what what is going to happen in the world of games oh, yeah. um there's just so much innovation in the way that music you know that interactivity works in games and it's just a really exciting time really and i think that, yeah a good way to serve yourself is honestly i guess it just sounds like i'm a guy who likes to play games saying yeah play games <laughs> play game. but seriously but play games with a purpose i mean yeah it's that i yes, mean that's that simple way. um you know yeah. i mean you, you, a lot of people play games that have fun or, you know, uh, competitive. There's a million different ways to play games. But if you're looking to get into music of it, obviously uh -huh. play it a different way. Yeah, play it with a purpose. 
see how yes. the levels work when you step out of this zone into this zone or the boss fight or what happens during different turns of the game because everything is programmed to be different and to grab your attention in certain ways and music is kind of the number one leading way of that you know yeah so, and the more the more you the more you practice that skill of paying right. it being really intentional and paying attention to what's happening the better you get at noticing nuances and going oh wait a minute i don't think there wasn't a kick drum going on before right. here. I, I I did so, something happened that changed the game state and the music responded or, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, or the music sounds dark all of a sudden. What did I, what did I do? I guess I'm losing the fight. Maybe it's, maybe that was intentional. It probably was. Right. Spoiler. Alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, uh -huh. you're losing. Hurry up. Um, <laughs> Whether it's 8-bit or full orchestra play music in a game, obviously this one's very tough, but what makes it good? Why? Why is 8-bit just as good as the <laughs> full, full orchestra of Halo? Why is Mario just as popular as the Halo theme song? Like, you think these should be completely different, but what makes these good? So, <laughs> it's a good question, an interesting question. I, I couldn't tell you, I will say that I couldn't tell you probably what makes something good in an objective sense because you know i don't think that exists I, I think that maybe i probably couldn't give you the formula for that but i could because that's so sub, that's such a subjective thing you know right. um but if i may what a thing i would say is that uh i could talk a little about like what's what makes the music effective in the game yeah I, and this shows why why it, it doesn't matter the style of music or the sounds. I think if the music serves the player's experience, mm. then it's good. And that means, um, you know, I think great game music, um, as we see, you know, it can interact with the player in a way. It can respond to the player. And I think if the game, if the music fits the vibe of the world that's being created in the game, then whatever sounds are used, they're they're legit and they're good. They're classical music. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we see, for instance, oh gosh, there's a game that I still love. I'm I'm not good enough to ever beat this game. Several years ago, um, you may have heard of the platformer Celeste. Yeah. Which is a gorgeous, you know, it has this gorgeous like pixel art kind of influenced style, but it's kind of painterly as well. Beautiful colors mm -hmm. and and Lena Rain's soundtrack. Oh, it's also a game about wrestling with anxiety and stuff. There's like an inner struggle in the game. And that her music for that is 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 this beautifully layered synthesizer sounds. There's a little bit of like that callback to old, you know, to to there's lots of synths and some older game sounds. Right. It now when I look at that game and see gameplay footage and listen to the music, it's it's a, a favorite score of mine. I, I can't separate the music from the game because I think it fits too. It's so perfect. So I can't even imagine any other music being there. Right. I think that that's to me that means. That it is doing its job. It's good. That's great music. Right. Uh, you, you know, uh, Shovel Knight. Jeez, Shovel Knight, the <laughs> in, indie title with this unbelievable yeah. eight-bit soundtrack. It's like a modern-day composed eight-bit soundtrack. It's virtuoso music. It's so busy and exciting and and thrilling. Did Shovel Knight end up? I think Shovel Knight won Game of the Year when it came out. I don't um, remember what for. I know it's won some awards, and by golly, it should have. It's an amazing. It's amazing, uh, and that's yes, that's it is a very good game. Yeah, but also then by the same token, so that that's great music. But mm -hmm. also, God of War Ragnarok, you right. know, just came out, and this, you know, it's like for this Norse mythology inspired world, and it's gods and giants and freaking dragons and yeah. you know. And and it's got this huge orchestra and a choir singing in old Icelandic. Uh, you know, you hear that music and you're like, wow, this is like getting my heart pumping for right. this big fight or whatever, you know, or it's so thrilling. Um, and that fits that world to a T. Um, so to me, that's what's good, you know. Or you got games like Streets of Rage uh four that just came out where you know you're it's high paced, it's kick butt, yes. like it's it's up to it's up to what you're doing. The new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game that came out that had uh, a, a really kick butt uh, soundtrack for um, it was kind of like, man, it was almost like a very early 90s urban feel type of music yep. to it. But it was it tied so well and it it didn't. The game itself fed off nostalgia of the old kind of platformers of Ninja Turtles, if you will. Yep. Um, but like the music just took it to a different level. 
Um, and the company that makes those games, they're so good at bringing those, what we loved yep. aspect of those couch co-ops, if you will. Um, yep. but it's just, they were so well done. I and, almost mentioned, I almost mentioned uh, Shredder's Revenge, right? Shredder's I Revenge, yeah. T. Lopez, his sound, his score. And by the way, T. Lopez, I believe started his musical career. He's, he's a very successful composer who started out, uh, doing YouTube remixes of like Sonic. Right. You know, right. To show off his skills and he got noticed like and, by, by the big wigs and, and they were like, so good. Yeah. Yeah. So revenge uh, was something else too. Like I can't, I can't tell you how many times we said, man, this soundtrack is kicking. Like every time we go into another level, it was like, I don't, this isn't part of music that was with the old Ninja Turtles, but it's enough. Like it was perfect to make the old game that they brought back fit right in i was like this is great even from the yeah. theme song that they made it yep, was so yep. well done it just fits the world the aesthetic the vibe so right. perfect you think nothing else could nothing else could even go here i think that's a sign of great that's great game music you know oh, perfect game music um so kind of getting on back of the track of you know their little timmy or little alice they want to get in and they want to do this music thing but what would you tell a parent or a kid that might have that itch to dive into music or formulating music for games. What would you tell them? I mean, like if similarly, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I would say again, you gotta, you gotta get to know your medium. So mm -hmm. obviously, but I think that's probably, you know, uh, kids that are probably interested in making music for games. They probably, they like games already. Right. They probably have a connection to that. Um, but I would say, um, and you know what? I'm going to steal this from uh, from our our friend uh, Kristen Nagus, who is a uh, we recently interviewed her for the show. She's okay. an incredible, uh, a, a versatile woodwind player. She mm -hmm. plays you know, on every soundtrack, every game soundtrack. I mean, you could probably you could probably throw at a dartboard and and any big soundtrack that's come out in the last five or eight it's years or something. Resume. She's probably contributed <laughs> a bunch of instruments to it. She's incredible, but she she comes back to just saying play music that you like mm -hmm. that's how she started her career and that's how so many people out there have started theirs find your instrument if the, if you like to play music really engage with that instrument you like the piano you know you've taken piano lessons and you really enjoy that really get into it find you know try to uh, listen to your favorite game tunes and try to create arrangements for the piano mm -hmm. play them uh uh you know, bring this stuff to your teacher. There are there are um, there are books out there now of sheet music. You know, there's even right. officially sanctioned stuff out there mm -hmm. um, that that you know this license that you can get. You know, you can get. Uh, oh, I just talked about Celeste earlier. There's an official Celeste Piano Collections uh, uh, an album, but then there's also a, a sheet music book. And so if you're like, oh, I loved that game. It kicked my butt, but I loved it. Uh, kicked most people's butts anyway. Uh, <laughs> very, very challenging game. Um, but like, you could be like, "Oh my god, I could play those tunes on piano." Yeah, you know, really. So I would say, yeah, for for any kid that's interested in creating music, start by playing. Start by playing music that you like. Really engage with your instrument or instruments, and and build outward from there. Um, because I think you're gonna, if you want to make music, you need to really be like fluent in music you know yeah. you need to be uh, you need to love music and and um listen to a lot of it and uh, i th i think that that's just where that's the seed that can grow in any number any different direction you know 100 percent uh totally agree um you know for me um i i was in a hole um i was watching so contra is one of my favorite soundtracks of all times from uh, Ooh, nes yeah. contra is so good um and uh, a does. lot of metal players picked that up and played on guitar and redo the song and it is just a banger and i got into a rabbit hole on youtube of these guitarists just murdering a uh, conscious theme song like just going to town and like there's so many people that did it differently but it still had the roots of what that song is um, and it was just so well done. Um, but yeah, there's yeah. so many aspects to it. Play the music that you like. I, I would, you know, no, I would just say, you know, thank you a million times over. It's so it's awesome talking to you. And yeah. yeah, we just we love making the show. Um, I'm so passionate about it. And I really I think that um game music is a great way for people to connect with classical music and and 
um, with music in general, um, you know, we know how popular orchestral concerts and different, you know, whatever, it doesn't have to be orchestra at all. Um, you know, game music concerts are are a big deal. And it's because it's part of it's part of our culture. And I think it's long past time that it gets celebrated um, on the airwaves. And and um, yeah, it actually it makes absolutely makes our life when we hear feedback not only from like the parents of kids right. that are listening and they're like yeah i heard undertale i love that you know that's such a great it's, i love it so much but also like it means so much to hear from people who have been listening to classical music on the radio their entire lives who go i i had no idea that there was music like this in video games i had no idea that's what we're all about and yeah. i i want to mention before i forget that if people want to binge or if the, if you want to listen to episodes of the show on demand the the show's uh website hub is gameplayshow.org yep. and also classical ipr is on instagram too so if you go to if you follow at classical ipr on instagram you'll see updates periodically little teasers and snippets from episodes and things like that as well yeah and if you need uh any information to uh ipr's show or uh we got uh keith brown's show um, you can find it um, and everything down below. Uh, we'll have all the information that you can grab it from. But yes, uh, his show is every Saturday at eight o'clock, I believe. Um, on yep, IPR. Saturday at eight, and then and then it re-airs Tuesday at six too. Yeah. So those are the perfect. Yeah. Love it. Um, so you're not done yet. We're done with questions, but we do have <laughs> this fun little game uh, that we call Ten Questions to Earn a One Up. The One Up is right there on top of Pac Man. Um, you don't get it, but that's a one up, obviously. Um, so, and ov obviously to don't go out and die because you can't use these one ups in real life. Sorry. But, um, yeah, 10 questions are one up the toughest 10 questions that you'll be taking all year. I can guarantee it. Um, will not ruin our friendship. Um, but Keith, Keith Brown, are you ready to take the 10 questions? Are one up? Let's do this. <laughs> All right, brother. Number one, Keith, what is the perfect sandwich? Oh, turkey. Oh, I don't know. Turkey club? Ooh, turkey club. Okay. I don't know. Okay. It's a nostalgic club. favorite. I don't know if that's the perfect sandwich, but it, it feels right to me. <laughs> it feels so. right. Uh, number two, iPhone or Android guy? I'm an iPhone guy. Good. Good job. That's the correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be easy so my you know my lizard brain can just go exactly and, stuff. and that's yeah. what iphone does very well make it super simple um number three the scariest animal oh my god so many scary animals i should really <laughs> so many um Snakes are pretty scary. I love snakes, but they're scary. Oh, let's yeah. see. Yeah. Um, they are. You know, I, I jump, you know, obviously, even if I know they're not going to hurt me, but yeah, I don't like to be around like, snakes. Yeah, like an anaconda, like something that's going to like... <laughs> they could know, eat you. <laughs> yeah, that's... that's uh, It just feels like, all right, I'm, I'm okay living over here. Yeah. And you can be over there, and that's fine. Uh, I will say I've been watching, uh, oh, what show is it? 18, oh, it's on Paramount+. Plus. It's about, like, it's a it's a spinoff of um, Yellowstone. It's, like, 1886 or something like that. Um, but, like, rattlesnakes were the biggest concern because, you know, you go out in the woods, you go pee, and all of a sudden, bam, snake gets you. I was like, yeah, I don't want to be anywhere where there's rattlesnakes. <laughs> Back in that day, you did. Oregon Trail. Uh, that was the game that we played. Somebody di right. died to a rattlesnake bite. Um, number four, favorite sports movie. Oh, wow. I haven't you know, I haven't watched a lot of them. You know, oh, golly. For, this is probably a, a cop out because I've just seen it so many times. But as a kid, I watched Rudy a bunch of times. Oh yeah, Rudy's a classic. Good. It was a Martian Man trip movie. Yeah, watch exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I meant to say, the marching bands always play video game music too. Like, do you ever see Ohio State when they did Mario and he was running through the horseshoe? That was. I mean, I'm not a huge Ohio State fan. Okay, I'm U of M fan. But when they did that, I had to give my kudos. Like, that was pretty cool. And they had Mario running across. They had Zelda. I'm going to have to look that up. That sounds awesome. Oh, man. I'm going to have to give you the YouTube clip. It was awesome. Um, number five. Halfway through here. You're, you're doing well. Would you rather spend a week in the forest 
or one night in a haunted house. You can afford us night in a haunted house. You know, I got to go with haunted house night yep. because I am. I struggle with the outdoors. I I love them and have have grown to appreciate. Them. <laughs> but like, my my wife would laugh at me. I, you, camping was always like very stressful for me because I'm like, oh, there's so much stuff I need to remember. I don't know something about. There's something maybe simple about staying in the in the haunted house. It's just I, I just stay up all night, tell myself you're gonna be okay. But at least I, I'm in a house. Maybe there's haunted plumbing. I can I'm I'm all right. Yeah. I mean, I I would do the same. I'm a horror fanatic though, so like the ten hours, like I can do both. I'm a hunter too, so like a week in the forest. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I would All take right. a one night off. Like that's, that's a good one. Um, number six, toughest question here. What number? My thing. Oh, seven hundred ninety-six. <laughs> No. Uh, number seven, plane, train, or automobile? <laughs> uh, train. I'm okay. going to go with train. A train. All right. I don't know. Um, number eight, what is Keith Brown's biggest fear? Biggest fear? You know, like, being stuck out of the country and not being able to like see my family or something i i worry about that sometimes okay. but that's also probably back from my opera days that never nothing like that ever happened to me but right no i know, get that like imagine being across seas and a pandemic hit and you can't come yeah, back home. i know all right yeah that's being being like cut off from my family is yeah that's um yeah that's a big fear um yeah. number nine dc or marvel guy Jeez, you know, that's tough. <laughs> you know, probably Marvel. I, I was more familiar with Marvel characters growing up. Probably. I was too, because, Marvel. you know, we had a lot of Marvel <laughs> cartoons. We had uh, X-Men. Exactly. Um, we had, I mean, obviously animated Batman was there, but DC didn't have nearly as much as Marvel did. We had Spider-Man. Uh, it's, it's a tough thing, because I, I feel like I was, my brother and I were enormous fans and still are of, you know, the animated series. Right. And and you know, Batman Beyond and all the other stuff, but that was kind of the only DC thing I was really into was like Batman stuff. Correct. So Marvel had Marvel has a million characters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, number ten, the last question here, and this one's a tough one. Like I presented to Dr. Matthew Thompson yesterday, this one because your music junkie is going to be very tough. Although I will say he's a music junkie and he got this in like two seconds. I don't know why. Um, but number ten, one song. For the rest of your life on repeat, what is it? Oh my god, that's brutal, man! <laughs> right? <laughs> oh wow, rest of my life on repeat. Yep. Jeez. Um. Oh, my brain is exploding. I'm trying to <laughs> something. Um. Ah, pro you know. Gee whiz, man. Maybe it would be, should it be like a really long song so I would like forget, you know, the how long the loop was? <laughs> no, it, would, it might be. It might be something by, you know, it might be a Metallica song. I don't know. I mean, there are of, a ton of Metallica songs. And, and some of them are long. Right. You go back to the old uh, catalog, I mean, prior Black Album, and they had those orchestra moments, man, where they would play eight nine minutes and seven of it would be just instrument here we go i just got one uh orion from master oh, of puppets there you go that one is an instrumental yep. i mean I, I love the i love james hetfield's voice and always have but uh i loved uh uh cliff burton's gorgeous bass playing yeah. on that track and it's got this beautiful melody it's a little bit classical influenced yep. yeah there we go i think maybe maybe i could go with orion for the rest of my life orion yeah. from master puppets metallica Keith Brown, you're off the chair, brother. You have earned your one up. Thank you, man, for being here. I really do appreciate it. Uh, give me some of your time. Talking about video games and music, of course, two of my big things. Uh, but you can find his show on Saturdays at 8 o'clock. Rerun on Tuesdays at 6 o'clock, um, I believe, on IPR. If you want to catch him, you can go to their website, interlockingpublicradio.org slash show slash gameplay. And that's the name of your show. I don't know if we've actually even gave out the name of your show, but it's called Gameplay. Um, yeah. So thank you, Keith, for being here. I really appreciate it, brother. Um, again, I'll be in touch, man. We have much more to talk about. I know we do. 
sure do, Michael. Yeah, this is a real pleasure, and, and thanks so much for, for reaching out. I, I, I'm just uh, very grateful. Here we go!